Chapter 3, The New Year Next to Christmas Day, the most pleasant annual epoch in existence is the advent of the new year. There are a lachrymose set of people who usher in the new year with watching and fasting, as if they were bound to attend as chief mourners at the obsequies of the old one. Now, we cannot but think it a great deal more complimentary, both to the old year that has rolled away, and to the new year that is just beginning to dawn upon us, to see the old fellow out, and the new one in, with gaiety and glee. There must have been some few occurrences in the past year to which we can look back, with a smile of cheerful recollection, if not with a feeling of heartfelt thankfulness. And we are bound by every rule of justice and equity to give the new year credit for being a good one, until he proves himself unworthy of the confidence we repose in him. This is our view of the matter. In entertaining it, notwithstanding our respect for the old year, one of the few remaining moments of whose existence passes away with every word we write, here we are, seated by our fireside on this last night of the old year, 1836, pinning this article with as jovial a face as if nothing extraordinary had happened, or was about to happen, to disturb our good humor. Hackney coaches and carriages keep rattling up the street and down the street in rapid succession, conveying, doubtless, smartly dressed coachfuls to crowded parties. Loud and repeated double knocks at the house with green blinds, opposite, announce to the whole neighborhood that there's one large party in the street at all events. And we saw through the window, and through the fog too, till it grew so thick that we rung for candles, and drew our curtains, pastry cooks men with green boxes on their heads, and round furniture warehouse carts, with cane seats and French lamps, hurrying to the numerous houses where an annual festival is held in honor of the occasion. We can fancy one of these parties, we think, as well as if we were duly dress-coated and pumped, and had just been announced at the drawing-room door. Take the house with the green blinds, for instance. We know it is a quadrille party, because we saw some men taking up the front drawing-room carpet while we sat at breakfast this morning, and if further evidence be required, and we must tell the truth, we just now saw one of the young ladies doing another of the young ladies' hair, near one of the bedroom windows, in an unusual style of splendor, which nothing else but a quadrille party could possibly justify. The master of the house with the green blinds is in a public office. We know the fact by the cut of his coat, the tie of his neckcloth, and the self-satisfaction of his gait. The very green blinds themselves have a Somerset air about them. Hark! A cab! That's a junior clerk in the same office, a tidy sort of young man with a tendency to cold and corns, who comes in a pair of boots with black cloth fronts and brings his shoes in his coat pocket, which shoes he is at this very moment putting on in the hall. Now he is announced by the man in the passage to another man in a blue coat, who is a disguised messenger from the office. The man on the first landing precedes him to the drawing room door. Mr. Tupple, shouts the messenger. How are you, Tupple? says the master of the house, advancing from the fire before which he has been talking politics and airing himself. My dear, this is Mr. Tupple, a courteous salute from the lady of the house. Tupple, my eldest daughter. Julia, my dear Mr. Tupple. Tupple, my other daughter. My son, sir. Tupple rubs his hands very hard and smiles as if it were all capital fun and keeps constantly bowing and turning himself round to the whole family have been introduced when he glides into a chair at the corner of the sofa and opens a miscellaneous conversation with the young ladies upon the weather and the theaters and the old year and the last new murder and the balloon and the ladies' sleeves and the festivities of the season and a great many other topics of small talk. More double knocks. What an extensive party. What an incessant hum of conversation and general sipping of coffee. We see Tupple now, in our mind's eye, in the height of his glory. He has just handed that stout old lady's cup to the servant, and now he dives among the crowd of young men by the door to intercept the other servant and secure the muffin plate for the old lady's daughter before he leaves the room, and now, as he passes the sofa on his way back, he bestows a glance of recognition and patronage upon the young ladies as condescending and familiar as if he had known them from infancy. Charming person, Mr. Tupple. Perfect ladies' man. 
Such a delightful companion, too. Laugh. Nobody ever understood Papa's jokes half so well as Mr. Tubble, who laughs himself into convulsions at every fresh burst of facetiousness. Most delightful partner. Talks through the whole set. And although he does seem at first rather gay and frivolous, so romantic and with so much feeling. Quite a love. No great favorite with the young men, certainly, who sneer at and affect to despise him, but everybody knows that's only envy, and they needn't give themselves the trouble to depreciate his merits at any rate, for Ma says he shall be asked to every future dinner party if it's only to talk to people between the courses, and distract their attention when there's any unexpected delay in the kitchen. At supper, Mr. Tupple shows to still greater advantage than he has done throughout the evening, and when Paul requests everyone to fill their glasses for the purpose of drinking happiness throughout the year, Mr. Tupple is so droll, insisting on all the young ladies having their glasses filled, notwithstanding their repeated assurances that they never can, by any possibility, think of emptying them, and subsequently begging permission to say a few words on the sentiment which has just been uttered by Paul, when he makes one of the most brilliant and poetical speeches that can possibly be imagined about the old year and the new one. After the toast has been drunk, and when the ladies have retired, Mr. Tupple requests that every gentleman will do him the favor of filling his glass, for he has a toast to propose, on which all the gentlemen cry, Hear, hear, and pass the decanters accordingly. And Mr. Tupple, being informed by the master of the house that they are all charged, and waiting for his toast, rises and begs to remind the gentlemen present how much they have been delighted by the dazzling array of elegance and beauty which the drawing room has exhibited that night, and how their senses have been charmed and their hearts captivated by the bewitching concentration of female loveliness which that very room has so recently displayed. Loud cries of, Here! Much as he, Tupple, would be disposed to deplore the absence of the ladies on other grounds, he cannot but derive some consolation from the reflection that the very circumstance of their not being present enables him to propose a toast, which he would have otherwise been prevented from giving. That toast he begs to say is, The ladies. Great applause. The ladies, among whom the fascinating daughters of their excellent host, are alike conspicuous for their beauty, their accomplishments, and their elegance. He begs them to drain a bumper to the ladies, and a happy new year to them. Prolonged approbation, above which the noise of the ladies dancing the Spanish dance among themselves overhead is distinctly audible. The applause consequent on this toast has scarcely subsided when a young gentleman in a pink underwaistcoat, sitting towards the bottom of the table, is observed to grow very restless and fidgety, and to evince strong indications of some latent desire to give vent to his feelings in a speech, which the wary tuple at once perceiving determines to forestall by speaking himself. He, therefore, rises again with an air of solemn importance, and trusts he may be permitted to propose another toast. Unqualified approbation, and Mr. Tupple proceeds. He is sure they must be all deeply impressed by the hospitality, he may say the splendor, with which they have been that night received by their worthy host and hostess. Unbounded applause. Although this is the first occasion on which he has had the pleasure and delight of sitting at that board, he has known his friend Dobble long and intimately. He has been connected with him in business. He wishes everybody present knew Dobble as well as he does. A cough from the host. He, Tupple, can lay his hand upon his, Tupple's, heart and declare his confident belief that a better man, a better husband, a better father, a better brother, a better son, a better relation in any relation of life than Dobble never existed. Loud cries of, Yeah! They have seen him tonight in the peaceful bosom of his family. They should see him in the morning, in the trying duties of his office. Calm in the perusal of the morning papers, uncompromising in the signature of his name, dignified in his replies to the inquiries of strange applicants, deferential in his behavior to his superiors, majestic in his deportment to the messengers. Cheers. When he bears this merited testimony to the excellent qualities of his friend Double, what can he say in approaching such a subject as Mrs. Double? Is it requisite for him to expatiate on the qualities of that amiable woman? No. He will spare his friend Dobble's feelings. He will spare the feelings of his friend, if he will allow him to have the honor of calling him so. Mr. Dobble, Jr. 
Here, Mr. Dobble Jr., who has been previously distending his mouth to a considerable width by thrusting a particularly fine orange into that feature, suspends operations and assumes a proper appearance of intense melancholy. He will simply say, and he is quite certain it is a sentiment in which all who hear him will readily concur, that his friend Dobble is as superior to any man he ever knew as Mrs. Dobble is far beyond any woman he ever saw except her daughters. And he will conclude by proposing their worthy host and hostess, and may they live to enjoy many more new years. The toast is drunk with acclamation. Dobble returns thanks, and the whole party rejoin the ladies in the drawing room. Young men who were too bashful to dance before supper find tongues and partners. The musicians exhibit unequivocal symptoms of having drunk the new year in while the company were out, and dancing is kept up until far in the first morning of the new year. We have scarcely written the last word of the previous sentence when the first stroke of twelve peals from the neighboring churches. There, certainly, we must confess it now, is something awful in the sound. Strictly speaking, it may not be more impressive now than at any other time, for the hours still as swiftly on at other periods, and their flight is little heeded. But we measure man's life by years, and it is a solemn knell that warns us we have passed another of the landmarks which stands between us and the grave. Disguise it as we may, the reflection will force itself on our minds, that when the next bell announces the arrival of a new year, we may be insensible alike of the timely warning we have so often neglected, and of all the warm feelings that glow within us now. Chapter 4 Miss Evans and the Eagle Mr. Samuel Wilkins was a carpenter, a journeyman carpenter of small dimensions, decidedly below the middle size, boring, perhaps, upon the dwarfish. His face was round and shining, and his hair carefully twisted into the outer corner of each eye till it formed a variety of that description of semi-curls usually known as agroitas. His earnings were all sufficient for his wants, varying from 18 shillings to one pound five weekly. His manner undeniable, his Sabbath waistcoats dazzling. No wonder that, with all these qualifications, Samuel Wilkins found favor in the eyes of the other sex. Many women have been captivated by far less substantial qualifications. But Samuel was proof against their blandishments, until at length his eyes rested on those of a being for whom, from that time forth, he felt fate had destined him. He came and conquered, proposed and was accepted, loved and was beloved. Mr. Wilkins kept company with Jemima Evans. Miss Evans, or Evans, to adopt the pronunciation most in vogue with her circle of acquaintance, had adopted in early life the useful pursuit of shoe-binding, to which she had afterwards superadded the occupation of a straw bonnet maker. Herself, her maternal parent, and two sisters formed an harmonious quartet in the most secluded portion of Camden Town. And here it was that Mr. Wilkins presented himself one Monday afternoon in his best attire, with his face more shining and his waistcoat more bright than either had ever appeared before. The family were just going to tea, and were so glad to see him. It was quite a little feast, two ounces of seven and sixpenny grain, and a quarter of a pound of the best fresh, and Mr. Wilkins had brought a pint of shrimps, neatly folded up in a clean belcher, to give a zest to the meal, and propitiate Mrs. Evans. Jemima was cleaning herself upstairs, so Mr. Samuel Wilkins sat down and talked domestic economy with Mrs. Evans, whilst the two youngest Miss Evanses poked bits of lighted brown paper between the bars under the kettle to make the water boil for tea. "'I was a-thinkin,' said Mr. Samuel Wilkins during a pause in the conversation, "'I was a-thinkin o' taking Jemima to the Eagle tonight.' "'Oh, my!' exclaimed Mrs. Evans. "'Lor, how nice!' said the youngest Miss Evans. "'Well, I declare,' added the youngest Miss Evans but one. "'Tell Jemima to put on a white muslin, Tilly!' screamed Mrs. Evans with motherly anxiety. 
and down came Jemima herself soon afterwards in a white muslin gown, carefully hooked and eyed, a little red shawl plentifully pinned, a white straw bonnet trimmed with red ribbons, a small necklace, a large pair of bracelets, Denmark satin shoes, and open-worked stockings, white cotton gloves on her fingers, and a cambric pocket handkerchief carefully folded up in her hand, all quite genteel and ladylike. And away went Miss Jemima Evans and Mr. Samuel Wilkins and a dress cane with a gilt knob at the top to the admiration and envy of the street in general and to the high gratification of Mrs. Evans and the two youngest Miss Evanses in particular. They had no sooner turned into the Pancras Road than who should Miss Jemima Evans stumble upon by the most fortunate accident in the world but a young lady as she knew with her young man. And it is so strange how things do turn out sometimes. They were actually going to the Eagle, too. So, Mr. Samuel Wilkins was introduced to Miss Jemima Evans's friend's young man, and they all walked on together, talking and laughing and joking away like anything. And when they got as far as Pentonville, Miss Jemima Evans's friend's young man would have the ladies go into the crown to taste some shrub which, after a great deal of blushing and giggling and hiding of faces in elaborate pocket handkerchiefs, they consented to do. Having tasted it once, they were easily prevailed upon to taste it again. And they sat out in the garden tasting shrub and looking at the buses alternately till it was just the proper time to go to the eagle. And then they resumed their journey and walked very fast for fear they should lose the beginning of the concert in the rotunda. "'Oh, heavenly!' said Miss Jemima Evans and Miss Jemima Evans's friend, both at once when they had passed the gate and were fairly inside the gardens. There were the walks, beautifully graveled and planted, and the refreshment boxes, painted and ornamented like so many snuff boxes, and the variegated lamps shedding their rich light upon the company's heads, and the place for dancing ready chalked for the company's feet, and a Moorish band playing at one end of the gardens, and an opposition military band playing away at the other. Then the waiters were rushing to and fro with glasses of negus and glasses of brandy and water and bottles of ale and bottles of stout and ginger beer was going off in one place and practical jokes were going on in another. And people were crowding to the door of the rotunda and in short, the whole scene was, as Miss Jemima Evans, inspired by the novelty or the shrub or both, observed, one of dazzling excitement. As to the concert room... Never was anything half so splendid. There was an orchestra for the singers, all paint, gilding, and plate glass, and such an organ. Miss Jemima Evans's friend's young man whispered it had cost four hundred pound, which Mr. Samuel Wilkins said was not dear neither, an opinion in which the ladies perfectly coincided. The audience were seated on elevated benches round the room and crowded into every part of it, and everybody was eating and drinking as comfortably as possible. Just before the concert commenced, Mr. Samuel Wilkins ordered two glasses of rum and water, warm with, and two slices of lemon, for himself and the other young man, together with a pint of sherry wine for the ladies and some sweet caraway seed biscuits. And they would have been quite comfortable and happy, only a strange gentleman with large whiskers would stare at Miss Jemima Evans, and another gentleman in a plaid waistcoat would wink and Miss Jemima Evans's friend, on which Miss Jemima Evans's friend's young man exhibited symptoms of boiling over, and began to mutter about people's imprints and swells out of luck, and to intimate, in oblique terms, a vague intention of knocking somebody's head off, which he was only prevented from announcing more emphatically by both Miss Jemima Evans and her friend threatening to faint away on the spot if he said another word. The concert commenced... Overture on the organ. How solemn! exclaimed Miss Jemima Evans, glancing, perhaps unconsciously, at the gentleman with the whiskers. Mr. Samuel Wilkins, who had been muttering apart for some time past, as if he were holding a confidential conversation with the gilt knob of the dress cane, breathed hard breathing vengeance, perhaps, but said nothing. The soldier tired, Miss Somebody in White Satin. Encore! cried Miss Jemima Evans's friend. Encore! shouted the gentleman in the plaid waistcoat immediately, hammering the table with a stout bottle. 
Miss Jemima Evans' friend's young man eyed the man behind the waistcoat from head to foot and cast a look of interrogative contempt toward Mr. Samuel Wilkins. Comic song accompanied on the organ. Miss Jemima Evans was convulsed with laughter. So was the man with the whiskers. Everything the ladies did, the plaid waistcoat and whiskers did, by way of expressing unity of sentiment and congeniality of soul. And Miss Jemima Evans and Miss Jemima Evans's friend grew lively and talkative, as Mr. Samuel Wilkins and Miss Jemima Evans's friend's young man grew morose and surly in inverse proportion. Now, if the matter had ended here, the little party might soon have recovered their former equanimity. But Mr. Samuel Wilkins and his friend began to throw looks of defiance upon the waistcoat and whiskers. And the waistcoat and whiskers, by way of intimating the slight degree in which they were affected by the looks aforesaid, bestowed glances of increased admiration upon Miss Jemima Evans and friend. The concert in vaudeville concluded. They promenaded the gardens. The waistcoat and whiskers did the same, and made diverse remarks complimentary to the ankles of Miss Jemima Evans and friend in an audible tone. At length, not satisfied with these numerous atrocities, they actually came up and asked Miss Jemima Evans and Miss Jemima Evans' friend to dance. Without taking no more notice of Mr. Samuel Wilkins and Miss Jemima Evans' friend's young man than if they was nobody. What do you mean by that, scoundrel? exclaimed Mr. Samuel Wilkins, grasping the gilt knob dress cane firmly in his right hand. What's the matter with you, you little humbug? replied the whiskers. How dare you insult me and my friend? inquired the friend's young man. You or your friend be hanged, responded the waistcoat. Take that, exclaimed Mr. Samuel Wilkins. The pharaoh of the gilt-knobbed dress cane was visible for an instant, and then the light of the variegated lamps shone brightly upon it as it whirled into the air, cane and all. Give it him, said the waistcoat. Or for sure, screamed the ladies. Miss Jemima Evans's bow, and the friend's young man lay gasping on the gravel, and the waistcoat and whiskers were seen no more. Miss Jemima Evans and friend, being conscious that the affray was in no slight degree attributable to themselves, of course went into hysterics forthwith, declared themselves the most injured of women, exclaimed in incoherent ravings that they had been suspected, wrongfully suspected, oh, that they should ever have lived to see the day, and so forth, suffered a relapse every time they opened their eyes, and saw their unfortunate little admirers, and were carried to their respective abodes in a hackney coach, in a state of insensibility, compounded of shrub, sherry, and excitement. <laughs>